This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights issues are still... The term Ubuntu. A alien and sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. With the success of the new documentary, The Black Power Mixtape, it seems that there's a generational obsession with the Black Power Movement. Journalist Joanne Griffiths examines Black Power in a contemporary context with her new book, Redefining Black Power Reflections on the Current State of Black America. And later we're joined by Professor Sean Harper, professor of education at the University of Pennsylvania, who will talk about his new research study on the ways in which we can find success for African American students and African American men in particular at historically white institutions. My name is Mark Anthony Neal and this is Left of Black. Good afternoon and welcome back to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon by longtime journalist Joanne Griffith, who is the editor of a brand new book, Redefining Black Power, Reflections on the State of Black America, that's published by City Lights Books. How are you doing this afternoon, Joanne? I'm very well. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. And, you know, black power seems to be in vogue these days. Um, you know, so many folks have had the opportunity to see the Black Power mixtape, uh, there's a new book that's coming out next month called Listen Whitey, uh, which is kind of a, a tabletop book, mem memorabilia of, of, of the Black Power era. And then, of course, your book. And, but your book really is less of a reflection on the historical notions of Black Power. Mm. Uh, it's really a contemporary take on it. You know, what are some of the most brilliant thinkers contemporarily thinking about the state of Black Power? And, and of course, just about everyone has a comment about, you know, the first black president, you know, Barack yes. Obama. Can you take us a little bit through, you know, what your thinking was in terms of pulling this book together? Well, this book really is the brainchild of Brian DeShazer with the Pacifica Radio Archives. And Mark, I don't know if you're familiar with the archives, but it dates back to 1949. Wow. And it holds <laughs> some 50,000 recordings from history. And a lot of that is actually from the civil rights and the black power oh, movement. So yeah. you have voices like Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King and Stokely Carmichael and just so many voices, Malcolm X. And Brian DeShazer really wanted to find a way to share that audio material. You know, audio deteriorates very quickly, yeah, whereas yeah. paper doesn't. Right. And he wanted to find a way to preserve that material. And it really came from one single recording of Fannie Lou Hamer mm -hmm. listening to her describe how she was beaten as she was on the road trying to help people to v register to vote. So we really have to thank um, Fannie Lou Hamer for, for this particular project and for really bringing this about. And redefining black power is a way, as you quite rightly say, it's not necessarily about looking back on the black power movement, but really taking an African-American perspective on this really transformative and historic moment in American social and political history. So I was very excited to to be a part of it, and especially to speak with the people that, that are involved in, in this part of the project with the book. I mean, talk about some of the people that you choose to sit down with. Uh, Michelle Alexander, of course, who has this wonderful book that's out uh, on New Jim Crow. Julianne Malvo, the, the well-known uh, economist and, of course, president of Bennett College here in North Carolina. Uh, someone like Lynn Washington, Jr., that, uh, you know, a lot of folks nationally may not know, um, but really has some incredible commentary about, you know, the state of, of the press at this point in time. And, and then, of course, the book opens with Vincent Harding. Um, and, and I'll start there. Talk a little bit about what it meant to begin the book with someone who literally has been on this journey a long time um, for his reflections on, you know, what he's seen over the last 50 years or so. And, and of course, he ends it with some really, in, you know, really incredible commentary about, you know, the first black president. Talk about Vincent Harding for a while. You know, meeting Dr. Vincent Harding really was such a gift for me personally and also for the way this project was, mm. was shaped. I, you know, I had the chance to speak to him for a Martin Luther King 40th anniversary of his assassination special for the BBC. So when this project literally fell in my lap, I was like, okay, this is someone that I have to speak to again. This yeah. is someone that yeah. I have to go back to. So I traveled out to Denver, Colorado and met in his vast office <laughs> that was just lined with books and history and knowledge and, and all of this kind of stuff. And he sat me down in a very 
professorial way. <laughs> and, you know, my intention was to talk with him about the civil rights movement and religion and the role of religion in activism. Right. And we sat down and I almost felt like he took my hand and I was asking him about, you know, his memories of the civil rights movement. And he said, before we begin, I want to talk about what we say in such journalese, the civil rights movement. Right. And he right. said, so every time you say the civil rights movement, yeah. I'm going to hear the movement for the expansion and deepening of democracy in America. Wow. It just floored me because yeah. I was like, okay, let's throw out all these notes, right, right. <laughs> all these preparation that I've done <laughs> like the last month. And, but what he was saying was, you know, he was excited and he saw it as very symbolic that, you know, we saw the election of an African-American man on November the 4th, 2008. But he said, you know, for all my years in the movement, you know, he was a speechwriter for Dr. Martin Luther right, King. He right. helped to craft that 1967 Beyond Vietnam speech. Right, right, in Riverside Church, yeah. Exactly. But he said, you know, all of our time in the movement, it never was about electing an African-American president. Yeah. Yeah, I, it was I mean, about human rights. I, I mean, it was about equality. Uh, what, so for him, he said, this is great. But he said, let's remember the work continues. When you look at the economy, when you look at the number of African-American men and women who are locked in the, the mass incarceration system, he said, victory is not ours yet. Yeah. But President Obama should think about not being commander in chief, but community organizer in chief. So. Just such wisdom from that one interview back in September 2009. I think if people just pick up the book and read that, it's worthwhile. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I was I was so struck reading that particular you know section of the book. I mean, when he just matter of factly said that he had never even thought about the question of a black president, right? It's, yeah. he, he didn't process it that way. Um, and, and then when he goes on to talk, you know, really strikingly about this idea that if this all becomes about this black president, mm -hmm. that, that in fact is a measure of the failure of democracy, right? When it stops being about us, yes. it really stops being about, you know, fundamentally about, about democracy. Right, he said, you know, and we have to remember that we're all part of the continuum you know, the work that they started back in the civil rights movement. And he said, you have to go back even further than that. You know, you've got to look at what people within slavery did, what happened in the movement, what's happening now. Even, you know, I haven't spoken to him for a little while, but even what's happening with things like the Occupy movement. We're all on a continuum. We all have work to do. And we can't sit and look at an individual like President Obama and say, he's arrived. He's the Messiah. He's our right. leader. Right. You know, he said, yes, President Obama said, yes, we can. Not yes, I can. And, and, you know, and Dr. Harding said, you know, we, we really drop the ball and we're really looking for trouble if we just sit down and say, OK, our work is done. He's like, the work is far from done. We're here with longtime journalist Joanne Griffith, who's the editor of a new book, Redefining Black Power, Reflections on the State of Black America. It is published by City Lights Books, coming out of San Francisco. Uh, the second chapter, you sit down with Michelle Alexander. And her book, you know, which, you know, at this point really should be required reading for everybody in, in some regards. I mean, the, the way that she talks about the connection between the contemporary aspects of the prison industrial complex and its relationship to Jim Crow, when you see a message like hers, and, and you know, in, in some ways she is, I don't want to say depressed about the state of things, but she's very clear that, you know, when you think about the state of the criminal justice system vis-a-vis -vis black folks, there is little evidence of black power at all. And, and, and that President Obama has, has, in some ways, very consciously not made that part of his agenda at all to address that. Talk a little bit about your conversation with Michelle Alexander. Well, Michelle Alexander, again, you know, she's very small, but she packs a lot of power yeah. <laughs> in her tiny frame and, and with her work with, with, with the new Jim Crow. But one of the things that, that she spoke about, or two things, in fact, actually, we, we started to, uh, um, as I did with all of the interviewees, talking about their memories of election night. Yeah. And Michelle said, you know, she was at this event in Ohio and everyone was on a high and they spilled out of this event. And she says, literally, she walked out and she saw this young black man with his hands handcuffed behind right. his back with his face in the gutter with five or six police yeah. officers standing around him as she says you know just kind of kicking it and shooting the breeze and she said you know what does the election of america's first black president mean to this man yeah. what does it mean yeah. for the brother at the bottom of the well as, right. as she put it 
And I think with, with Michelle, you're right, you know, she is saddened by what she has seen inside the mass incarceration system. You know, she, she says that there are more African-American men within the mass incarceration system than there were that were enslaved back in 1850. I mean, that's incredible. You know, yeah, that was incredible those are numbers. depressing statistics. Yeah. But what is encouraging is that, you know, she's taking her work, she's looking at it, you know, she's, she's an activist, you know, she's using the law, but she is an activist through and yeah. through. And she said, you know, again, we have to be responsible for um, putting pressure on our politicians, putting pressure on our elected officials, not looking at these individuals, not just President Obama, but many others who we see as mm -hmm. black leaders. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, we are all leaders within our communities. So, it, you know, and it's a theme that runs throughout every single person I spoke with. It always comes back to, yeah, it's great that we have a black president. But what are we doing on a on an individual right. level? What, and and this is kind us, of what yeah. we're seeing come out with these talks. I was in Los Angeles and San Francisco and, and in Oakland last week. I'll be um, in D.C. on Thursday and New York next week. Yeah. And, you know, this is what's coming up. It's like, OK, it's great. What's happening locally? What can we do? as individuals so you know it, it's kind of it's bringing up feelings of we, we need to take back or reclaim our power in some way you also talk with van jones who of course was the president's green czar um the green job czar you know for a little while um our good friend and colleague esther arma who of course is a journalist in, in new york city but you also talked to ramona africa you know who's uh, remaining she was a, the only adult survivor of the move bombing in 1985 and, and i love the title of that chapter um you know, that Bar Barack Obama is the new crack. <laughs> can, can you unpack that for a while? I mean, because it's, it's, you know, it, it sounds itself like it'd be a great title for a book in and of itself. Absolutely. <laughs> but but un unpack that idea of Barack Obama being the new crack. <laughs> well, again, what was interesting with Ramona, it was just another, another slice of activism, another look at you know, I, I think sometimes speaking with some colleagues, um, and it's been interesting talking with folks about this book, there's a feeling that as African-Americans or people from, you know, Africans from throughout the diaspora, that we all agree that it's a good thing to have a black a president. president. And I yeah. think on the whole, um, a lot of people, a lot of black people throughout the world do think it's a good thing to have an African-American president, if only for the symbolism of it. And what I liked with the interview with Ramona, she said, listen, President Obama is a politician. Right. And politicians <laughs> will do what politicians are wont yeah. to do. Right. And she said, black, white, green, pink, or yellow, we can't dismiss that. So when she came up with this thing, and it was actually a conversation that she had with Fred Hampton Jr. Junior, right. And they were having this discussion. And he said, you know, Barack Obama is the new crack for the black community. Uh, He's uh, our new uh, drug. Uh, President uh, Obama has anesthetized right, right, us. Right. And Essentially, what Ramona and Fred Hampton Jr. meant by that is that people, African-American people, are taking their eye off the ball. They're so enthralled with um, this, the history of it, with the, the symbolism election. of right, it, right. that they don't want to be critical or analytical right. or kind of say, look, it's great that you're there, but my children are dropping out of school or half of the men in my family are in prison right. or my house has been foreclosed on and I don't have anywhere to live. So their feeling is that we're not necessarily tackling the issues because there's this kind of paralysis of analysis, if you like, yeah. because he is the first. So, you know, it, it was powerful words and a lot of people kind of wince when they hear it. But, you know, <laughs> you've got to read it to understand her point. And, and, and it's a point that, you know, Julianne Malvo makes in another context, right? When, when she talks about hearing the president in those first couple of speeches and, and, and really him challenging us to challenge him. Right, that, that he can't do this successfully by himself. And of course, you know, we've all heard the story of A. Philip Randolph, you know, talking with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, and Roosevelt telling him, if you want me to do some things, you have to push me, but I can't do it if you don't hold me accountable. And, and as, you know, Ramona Africa talks about it and, and what really is kind of an overriding theme of, of your book, Redefining Black Power, you know, we've really dropped the ball in terms of holding this president accountable in ways that we wouldn't have thought twice of holding the previous presidents accountable, you know, when it comes to issues that impact our communities. Yeah, and you know, and Julianne um, Malvo, you know, obviously she's talking about it from um, an economist right. um, pers perspective, but she said, you know, you look at 
the LGBT community, you look at the Latino community, she said, right. you know, no one else has an issue asking for what, <laughs> for, they for what their issues are. Right? she's like, us as black folks, we're not quiet. <laughs> so why is it now that we're quiet? And, you know, we're kind of slowly seeing like the Congressional Black Caucus come forward and, and say, look, these are some of the things that we need. Right. Um, you know, my local congresswoman here, Maxine Waters, right. has been quite critical of President Obama as well. So we're slowly seeing it, but I think there's a question of whether um, it's a little bit too late. The unemployment rate, even though for African Americans it has come down from that shockingly high rate of 16%, I think we're only just under 14%, right. when the rest of the nation is like just a shade under nine, or I think it might even be eight and a half now. So we still have a long way to go to tackle the issues that are happening in our communities. And it, it's just a hope that as we head towards this next election in 2012, that you know we, we, we pick up our boots and we and we start singing a little bit louder than, <laughs> than perhaps we have been over the past few years. You're watching Left to Black. We're joined by longtime journalist Joanne Griffith, who's the editor of a brand new book, Redefining Black Power: Reflections on the State of Black America. Were there any people, Joanne, that you wanted to talk to for the book but didn't get a chance to? Yeah, well, there was one person that I really wanted to speak to, and, and actually two people who, who both actually passed in the, um, the process of the book. Um, Dr. Dorothy Height mm -hmm, um, was mm -hmm. one of them. Um, there was, I, I guess I kind of really felt that, you know, we, there are so many black male leaders, right, not right. thinking of Al Sharpton's and right. Jesse Jackson's, and but we don't necessarily hear from the women, you know, people who are passing, you know, people like Shirley Chisholm, I would have loved yeah, to, yeah. to interview, you know, we look yeah. at, and um, President Obama as the first. No, he wasn't. Right. Shirley Chisholm he was. Yeah. was the first. And can I say, a countrywoman from my native Barbados. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> We're small nation, but but mighty indeed. But you know, but it's important that people like that are reflected. Um, you know, so yeah, so Dr. Dorothy Height, I would have loved to have spoken to. Um, Ron Walters, um, the, the long time veteran journalist who had such mm, insight. Right, 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 right politics and society, you know, um, again, he was someone who passed during um, the, the process of this. Someone that I did speak to, actually, who isn't in the book, but who will be available, the interview will be available as added concept, content on the website, redefiningblackpower.com, is um, Dr. Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Um, <laughs> you know, I he, he was one, like, literally, when I started the project, he was top of the list. Yeah. <laughs> We finally managed to arrange an interview in, in August of, of 2010. But what was what was upsetting, what was sad, I mean, wonderful interview, very warm man, phenomenal insight into the history of the civil rights movement and his place within that, was that it really felt like he was so scarred by what happened yeah, with right, the right. administration. We talked for two hours and he mentioned his name once. Wow. And so we didn't actually put it in the book because, you know, this is a conversation about the state of black America today and it felt more like a historical piece. Um, but again, that is material that will be available yeah. on the website for people to hey. listen to because, you know, he's he's one of our elders. He's someone who's fought on the front line. And yeah, very, very interesting man to talk to. Very interesting indeed. And that's one of the things, you know, Lynn Washington makes that point about the failure of the mainstream press, really, and the left press and the black press, that when Jeremiah Wright made his now infamous statement, you know, no one did the work to put that frame, put those comments in context. And, and when you hear it in context, it all makes sense. And, and no one wanted to do that, right? They were looking for, you know, a sensationalist issue, right, to frame, you know, this campaign of, of the person who eventually would become the first black president. Uh, you're in New York on February the 21st and February the 23rd. You're doing two events, one at the Brett Forum, uh, an all-woman panel, and, and also at Human Bookstores up in Harlem on the 23rd. Talk a little bit about those two events and what you're hoping to achieve with them. Well, there's so much going on in, in New York. There are so many <laughs> issues. And honestly, there were so many fantastic panelists. I was like, OK, I think we're just going to have to do two. So with the women's panel, the Brecht Foreman Forum on the February the 21st, we have um, Esther Amar, playwright, author, dear friend and um, host of uh, the Wake Up Call on WBAI. Yes, yes. Um, also Michaela Angela Davis, image mm -hmm. activist, and also Akiba Solomon, um, columnist with right. colorlines.com. And um, so those three ladies, wonderful, 
talented, enthusiastic, and they're going to be talking about women in media and how black women in particular are portrayed in the press. I know that's going to be a fiery discussion we've just seen very recently. Even the first lady having to defend being described right. as an angry right. black woman. woman right. We're not angry. We're really not angry. This is not an angry face. Not angry. So we'll be we'll be breaking down that with those three ladies at the Brett Forum on, on Tuesday the 21st. Um, I think that one's from 7 p.m. And then on Thursday the 23rd at Human Books. Really excited to, to be going there and to be supporting black-owned independent yeah. bookstores. And we've been at S1 here in Los Angeles and also at Marcus Books up in the Bay. So really excited to come to, to Human on Thursday the 23rd. We turn it over to the gentleman, um, yourself, Mr. Mark <laughs> Anthony Neal, and also filmmaker, documentarian, and all-round good people, Byron, Byron Hurt. Hurt yes. And we're going to be talking about the role of the African-American man in the age of Obama. So often our men are described, again, as angry and no good and i'm like you know that's not the image or yeah. of any black man that i know so you know really looking forward to those conversations and you know this whole project and you know i've, I've really been saying this you know the book is is one part of, of the conversation you know i talk with seven people in this book but this is really about turning it over mm. to the public this is a, a project that's available to everybody where you can talk about what's going on in your community the things that are concerning you and also share your voice this is a way for us to to bring together a true african-american and african diaspora perspective on the age of Obama, so that when the historians, when me and you, Mark, are like 110 <laughs> and we're looking back on this moment in history, you know, we, you know, black people will be speaking for themselves on this moment in history. So do come on out if you can't go to redefiningblackpower.com, send us your blog posts, your videos, your audio contributions. You know, we, we really want to hear from you. So, you know, I've had a blast putting this book together, but, you know, the real work starts now, yeah, yeah. you know, so. Looking forward to hearing from everybody. We've been joined this afternoon by Joanne Griffith, who's a longtime journalist and the editor of the new book, Redefining Black Power, Reflections on the State of Black America. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, Joanne. Thank you so much for having me, Mark, and looking forward to seeing you on the 23rd. Yes, thank you. Take care. Thanks. What's up, guys? <laughs> What's up, man? How was school? Good. Yeah? What'd you do? We got to pet my teacher dog. She brought her dog to school? Yeah. Yeah? So what'd you learn today in school, man? Um, we're starting world history. Oh yeah, world history? Yeah, today we learned about Africa and tomorrow we're gonna learn about Rome. Wait, wow, so one day for Africa, huh? I guess. Well, what did you learn? That there were pharaohs and big huge pyramids in um Egypt. Uh -huh. And that there are 86 countries on the continent. Wow, mm -hmm. I like this. And, and that a lot of slaves came from West Africa. Oh, that's what you learned? Yeah. And also that the oldest bones of humans was found there. Were found there. Huh? Were found there. Well, did you learn that Africa was full of queens and kings and some of the first democratic societies were found in Africa? No. Africa was full of thousands of languages and religions. Watch yourself. And that some of the most amazing artists and scientists that ever walked the face of the earth lived in Africa? No. And that man's oldest relatives, like one of the most sustainable civilizations ever, started there in Africa and still lives there today, actually. Did you learn any of that? No. Okay. Well, after dinner, we're going to look at some of my African history books, okay? Okay. Hold your head as high as you can High enough to see who you are, little man Life sometimes is cold and cruel Maybe no one else will tell you So remember that you are Black gold, black gold You are black gold Now maybe no one else has ever Dinner, come get your food. Welcome back to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon by Professor Sean Harper, 
Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equality in Education at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of several studies on black men in higher education, including the recently released report, Black Male Student Success in Higher Education, a report from the National Black Male Achievement Study. How are you doing today, Sean? Great, Mark. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, you're in your offices at the University of Pennsylvania, I presume? I am. Hoping the city of Philadelphia is still a city of brotherly love. It uh, is indeed. Thanks for having it us on the show. <laughs> Uh, you know, this study is very timely. You know, we've been having some very interesting discussions here at Duke University about the success of African American black students uh, in, in, in challenging situations like a situation like Duke. So the study is very timely. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the report that this is the largest qualitative study ever on black male undergraduates. Um, you know, why do you think such a study has taken so long to, to, to occur? I think because. Mark, people are fascinated with statistics mm -hmm. and, you know, much of the work that has been done on black males, not just in higher ed, but also in K-12 schools and in the largest social science literature, you know, seeks to quantify our, our plight and our plague. Our pathology. Uh, some right. folks, you know, right. do a lot of gap gazing right. Right. concerning black men <laughs> without taking the time to really understand the substance and the texture of our lives. And, and you begin the report really taking that to task head on, right? You know, we all know these kind of numbers, and I mentioned some of them. You know, 47% of black males don't graduate high school on time. Black male students, on average, are less prepared than their peers. Only 4.3% of students currently enrolled in college and universities are black men. They're overrepresented on, in, in revenue generating collegiate sports. Uh, college completion rates are far lower than much of their peers. You know, the, the, all of that is tethered to some sort of notion of pathology. And as you mentioned, so much of the scholarship is about validating that pathology. Right. But yet your study takes this different tact, the idea of an anti-deficit view. Talk a little bit about that dynamic, the anti-deficit view. Sure. Before I do that, Mark, I just want to acknowledge how you very nicely summarized, um, <laughs> as I did in the report, in about a page and a half, all of these boom and boom statistics, and then we're done with it, right? So uh, we go on and spend the rest of the report, you know, flipping those statistics inside Absolutely. out, and that's Absolutely. really what the anti-deficit framework is all about: is taking what has been reported about black men in higher education and other social spaces, and turning those questions on their head. So instead of asking why are, there, why are there so few in college? Why do they drop out in such high numbers? Why are they so disengaged? And so on. The framework turns those questions on their head and asks, well, how did these guys get to college? Right. Why right. is it that they're engaged? Right. Um, right. You know, what are sort of the, 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 the catalysts for their engagement? How do they negotiate popularity with their peers alongside academic achievement? And how is it that these guys successfully navigate their way through often racist and unsupportive campus yeah, environments? Right. I think those things are really important, but they're questions that we typically don't ask. It, it's a different framing. We're talking today with Professor Sean Harper, who's Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equality in Education at the University of Pennsylvania. We're talking about his newly released study, Black Male Student Success in Higher Education, a report from the National Black Achievement Study. I mean, one of those reframing questions, you know, I think is really fascinating in terms of this whole idea, you know, where do we actually cultivate aspiration for, you know, secondary, post-secondary education in black men? And, and it's interesting, right, we can talk about all these numbers, but fundamental questions like where do young black men even have a desire to want to go to college are questions that we typically don't ask. Right. And when we think about young men, it is important for them to have exposure to black men who have gone to college. It's very difficult yeah, to yeah. aspire to something that you've never seen. And I don't mean just that you've never seen, you know, on your block or in your family, but also as we think about the representation of black men and black people in yeah. the media, yeah. for example, and in, in, in statistics and in textbooks and so on, a lot of young black students don't see themselves represented in the curricula of their schools. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you know, the only thing they have to aspire to, aspire to in many instances is the doom and gloom portrait that is consistently reinforced at every corner that we turn. I'm also at this time reading a study that's about, you know, the framing of black masculinity 
yeah. in, in popular culture and also how black men consume popular culture. And, and I was struck recently by the Esperanza Spalding video uh, for her new song, Black Gold. And I don't know if you had a chance to see no, the I video, was, yeah. uh, but the video is amazing because it's all framed around what's a single father, black man, working class. I mean, he literally has his work gloves in his pocket and he's picking up his two sons from school and having this long conversation with them about black history while he's also making them dinner when they get back home. Oh. And, and, I, and I forced my 13 year old daughter to sit down and watch that image to, to explain to her about how important it was because we very rarely see engaged black male fathers at all right in popular culture let alone as single fathers but where the critical piece of it was this idea of education right right but you know mark those guys do exist absolutely you're right. an engaged father you <laughs> yeah. said you sat down with your daughter right to to watch this right you know people very rarely come to folks like you who are you know, engaged parents who are, who embody, you know, the complete opposite of, you know, again, what we see is right. completely, you know, like reinforced over and over and over again about us. You know, this whole business of, you know, more than two thirds of black men drop out of college. And in fact, it's, it's right around exactly two thirds, right? Okay, that's a really serious problem. So I don't want to, um, you know, diminish the importance of that problem. But there is a remaining one third who actually do, do graduate succeed, from college. Right, right. and, what, and is, what is the skill set that they have used to be able to succeed, right? Right, right. And you're a father who is very much present in your, in your children's lives. So I, you know, I, I just think that we need to talk to more people on the other side of the doom and gloom statistics. And, and that's one of the, also the wonderful things about this report. I mean, you spend some time looking at some of these success stories you know, kids that are at Harvard, you know, kids who have gone and graduated from Stanford and, and, and own their own companies, you know, I mean, amazing kinds of stories. So that qualitative piece, I mean, and part of this kind of debate over the study that has talked about undergraduate students, black undergraduate students at Duke, you know, sure. what you see, you know, very visibly is this disconnect, disconnect between the quantitative research that's coming out around these, crunching the numbers versus right. the qualitative things, right? We, we need to see these stories, right? We need right. to see these examples. Uh, I'm struck by your point earlier about, you know, where do teenage black boys, for instance, see images of black men in college? And, and again, I think, again, uh, you know, it's hard for me to think about any of this research. I have two daughters, right? And, and sure. uh, I'm so compelled by research on black men and boys in part because I know my daughters are gonna to have to try to navigate a world in which they try to find modes of partnership with black men, whether that's romantic or otherwise. Right. And, and I'm wondering where those men are going to be, you know, by the time they become, you know, adults themselves. And, and I very often look at young men, boys, in, in my youngest daughter's classroom. Um, and it strikes me that there's so few black male teachers, you know, in those schools. Sure. Um, I mean, these in some cases, we're talking about young boys who don't even get to see black men read books. Right. You know, this conversation we had with Mark Lamont Hill recently, you know, they don't see black men read books, let alone think about black men as authors or professors and, and all those kinds of things. Sure. Um, what are some of the strategies that you suggest, you know, for us to deal with this kind of gap, if you will, in terms of the reality of what black men are capable of doing as college students and, and what the popular opinions of? Are. Right. So I'm going to work through your question, but I, I want to go back to <laughs> this is a really complex question. But I want to go back, though, to the point that you just made about the need for black male teachers. Um, I am definitely on board with with that. You won't get an argument from me that we don't need more black male teachers. Absolutely. We need men in classrooms whom boys and other black students can see as role models right. and so on. That's really important. But I would argue perhaps more important, Mark, is what we do with the white ones, right? <laughs> yeah. The overwhelming majority of the teachers of black boys are white women. So until we do something to remediate their practices. And, 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 and I love that language that you use, right? The, the remediation of teaching professionals about how to deal with this population. You know, folks here remedial, they're always talking about the kids. And it's like, no, we right. need to think about the teacher, teaching professionals in this context. Right. And you know, Mark, I, I teach in a school of education. So, you know, I'm taking this on as sort of our professional responsibility to ensure that white women and others who leave our school and leave other schools of education 
have the cultural competence, that they've done the, the hard work of, you know, being self-reflective about their own biases and their privilege and the ways in which they've been socialized to think about black men. You know, it's really, really difficult, perhaps even impossible to effectively educate someone if you've been socialized to be afraid of them. Um, but, you know, those yeah. kinds of things yeah. don't get unpacked. They, they, yeah. they, they never really get confronted in the overwhelming majority of teacher preparation programs. So, you know, that is a necessary step Absolutely. in improving educational outcomes for black students, in addition to getting more black male teachers. You talk about the experiences of black men on college campuses, black students, and some research that you recently done about this concept of onlyness, you know, what you call the psycho-emotional burden of having to str strategically navigate a racially politicized space occupied by few peers, role models, or guardians. Could you unpack a little bit this concept of onlyness, right? Because I, I think if you were to describe that to a room full of black undergraduate students, regardless of gender, right. a light would go off immediately, right? That suddenly the language to explain the experience. As I heard you read it back to me, a light went off in my <laughs> head, right? So, you know, onlyness, I'll personalize it. So when I came to Penn, I was the first person of color hired in my department wow. and in wow. my division. And I continue right. to be the first and the only person of color, you know, who's a standing faculty member Ten in years. my right. division. Right. So therefore, I am the only one, right? And that brings with it, you know, this constant burden of, you know, when do I speak out against uh, certain things that I think may be, may be racialized or right. when do I, right. you know, put myself out there without the assurance of having some support from, 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 from others who experientially can understand from where I'm coming. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine doing that work as a 20 year old college student. Yeah. You know, I thank God that I went to Albany State, a historically <laughs> black school university, yeah. because yeah. I, I didn't have to confront these kinds of yeah. realities that I heard the students in my National Black Male College Achievement talk about how all day long in every single class they would take, they would be the only black student. And there was this constant anxiety about sort of misrepresenting themselves, misrepresenting the race. Stereotype threat, right. Stereotype right. threat, for sure. Right. Um, you know, being picked last for groups and having to, to wonder, you know, was I picked last for the group because I'm the only black dude in the class or because <laughs> yes. people didn't like the shoes I was wearing? Right. Yet, yet, yet if it was a, a game of pickup in the gym, right, right. it's a totally right. different process. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're here with Sean Harper, who is Associate Professor of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also directs the Center for the Study of Race and Equality in Education, again at the University of Pennsylvania, talking about his new study, Black Male Student Success in Higher Education. But were there anything in your findings that really surprised you, Sean? Sure, I, and I say in the report that the most surprising finding to me, Mark, was that almost unanimously across the interviews, the guy said, you were the very first person to sit me down to ask me how I successfully navigated my way to and through this place. Um, you know, I, I think it interesting that 221 guys were nominated for the study. Mm -hmm. 219 of them said yes. Wow. They agreed to wow, have me interview them for two to three hours. These were very long interviews. I mean, is that uh, normally the kind of ratio that you get, you know, with requests for these kinds of interviews? No. <laughs> no. I didn't think so, yeah. These guys were, were very enthusiastic about telling their stories because, you know, not to pat themselves on the back, but because they knew that the insights that they shared could be instructive for other black male students. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this work right now. I'm working on this new piece about how black men experience uh, loss mm. um, mm -hmm. of, of their peers, you know, dealing with the whole like two thirds who drop out. You know, I, it, when, when you hear the guys who remain talk about how those guys who left. have left, they, yeah. they, they, they wow. say, you know, wow. the guys who are no longer with us. It almost sounds like the guys passed away. Yeah. So, and, and know, I mean, almost related to the kind of trauma that some of these men experience with the guys who never make that road to college, right? Who right. get lost in the everyday urban shuffle, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, these guys felt some sense of like real, like social and moral obligation mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. share their stories, share mm -hmm. their insights. These guys had Im impressive navigational secrets 
that no researchers or you know no faculty member or administrators on their campus had sought to use as a resource instead you know folks on those campuses were trying to figure out well what do we need to do to improve the rates of black male retention and graduation and success but they never talked to the guys, guys who were successful it. right right <laughs> Classic, yeah. It feels so counterintuitive to me. Uh, let me ask you this question, Sean. Um, you know, for, for someone like yourself, and you know, you have some wonderful colleagues, you know, at the University of Pennsylvania, John Jackson, Guthrie Ramsey. Uh -huh. um, I think about someone like Mark Lamont Hill. You know, right. what is our responsibility um, in this conversation to black male students on our campuses? Um, and, and, you know, and I don't have to tell you what all this is in terms of what it means for us to ourselves be successful in these spaces, in terms of being productive scholars, dealing with departmental politics, you know, being right. able to have some sort of responsibility beyond the ivory tower, you know, to broader right. communities. You know, what kind of things are there that we can do as, as representative black male faculty, you know, to be able to connect with black male students who are trying to navigate these spaces? I think it's just that we have to find ways to connect with them um, that are substantive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give two examples here that you know I, I swear are not you know me patting myself on the back, but they just are what they are. They're, they're examples. So as I'm doing this interview with you in my office, my undergraduate mentee is you know sitting here listening to the interview yeah. in my office yeah. with me. Yeah. He's doing yeah. his homework, but you know also also listening. Uh, to the interview. I, I hope that, you know, being a part of this conversation will inspire him to, you know, use his platform to, you know, be engaged with, you know, yeah. younger black men that he will encounter in his career. That's just sort of a real time example. Another example is um, here at Penn, I advise a black male student group, Black Men United. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's a discussion group. We get together, you know, eight times throughout the semester for a couple hours, and we, we talk about issues that are pertinent to black men here at Penn or black men in the larger social context, or just, you know, black people. We talk about politics and, and all sorts of important things. Um, you know, Mark, that, that takes an hour and a half of my time, yeah, yeah. a couple times throughout the semester. Yeah. And I'm not as busy as you, but I'm a pretty busy guy. <laughs> I, I look forward to that venue and that space to be able to, you know, bring some authenticity to my work yeah, and yeah, also, yeah. you know, let the brothers see me. And, you know, I also, I, I get something from it too. I see them and, you know, they help me to sort of think about my own work in more complex ways, particularly my work around black masculinities. Um, so I, 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 I think that it doesn't take a lot, but the little things that we can do to be present in their lives could really go a long way. Bringing them aboard to do uh, collaborative writing with us right, right. Is, um, is another example. I mean, you're at Duke, I'm at Penn. We have really bright students here, Absolutely. really bright undergraduates. Absolutely. Sometimes the undergraduates are smarter than the grad students, right? They're more talented <laughs> than the grad students in some instances. So. You know, even having them work with us on, on, on collaborative writing projects could be another, another thing that's important. Absolutely. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Sean Harper, who is Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Equality in Education at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has just released a new report, Black Male Student Success in Higher Education, a report from the National Black Male Achievement Study. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, Professor Harper. Thanks for having me, Mark. And hopefully we'll see you down here at Duke sometime soon. All right, I look forward to it. Take care. Okay, you too. by Duke University, online at duke.edu.